what I want to talk to you about is the P's that have helped me achieve peak performance. And I don't know if any of you have heard of the five P's that are often quoted. Anybody heard? Anybody familiar with planning and preparation prevent poor performance? Is there a version of that? Yeah, yeah there's, there's a few other versions out there. Now, this one's always bothered me in my work as a sports psychologist and as a business coach, because, and also from my own sporting experience, because I know you get what you focus on. And if you focus on preventing poor performance, you might at best get okay performance or maybe good performance. But are you going to get peak performance? I don't think so. So before I go into talking about it, I just want to put paragliding into context a little bit. As you can see, I don't seem to have a, I don't seem to have a pointer on it. Anyway, never mind. No pointer. Okay, as you can see there, um, you're sat in a swing seat, suspended on a whole load of lines underneath some sailcloth filled with air. And you use this to get from A to B. And the way you use it, and I'm going to be talking about thermal flying, is you climb up in a thermal, which is a column of warm rising air, and then you go off on glide until you find the next column of warm rising air. And I like to think of it as a game of three-dimensional snakes and spiral ladders. So you take the ladder up to cloud base, you head off on your snake, you find another ladder back up to cloud base, and that's how you get from A to B. Now, when I stopped and started to reflect on how did I actually achieve a world record? And what I came to think about was it wasn't about preventing poor performance. It was about focusing on achieving peak performance. And I did that through what I call my secret three Ps, which I'm now making public, which are about having passion and then doing great planning and preparation with a focus on the performance you want to achieve. So this is one of my stories. So I want to take you back to a bar in the spring of 1994. It's quite late at night. I've had a few beers. Um, it's the end of a paragliding competition. Um, there's a group of us talking about what we want to achieve that year. It's the year after I'd achieved that bronze medal in the World Championships. And all of a sudden, I hear myself say, do you know, I'd absolutely love to set or break a world record. And the icing on the cake would be to break that elusive 100-kilometer barrier, so flying over 100 kilometers. Inside of me, I can hear my heart rate going up, and there's a little voice going, oh my god, why did you let that out? Because now you're going to have to do something about it. But what happened with that energy shift was I actually tapped into the passion I felt about my purpose. And the amazing thing was, as well, once I put it out there and made it public, you'll see all these P's that are coming out, that there were offers of support and information and ideas coming from all around me which was quite interesting, because for 18 months I'd been thinking about it. So wind forward a few months. I'm sitting on a launch site in central Spain. I've spent the last three months planning what I'm going to do. What records did I want to set? Was I capable of setting? Which ones needed breaking? Where were the best places to go? What was the best terrain to be flying over for my preferred style of flying? What were the best weather patterns, the best seasons? Who were going to be my support team? Because even when you're doing an individual sport, you still need a support team behind you. So all these things were going through my mind. And here I am, sat on launch, doing the final preparations, studying the map for that day. This is the map. I haven't got the pointer, but I've highlighted the key points there. Um, <coughs> The planning and preparation also included being in the area in central Spain for the week before I was flying the world record, flying and driving the terrain, talking to the local pilots, sussing out what were going to be the hot spots, what were the danger areas, where were the sort of risks of kind of landing short, um, and really getting an idea of what was going to be the best route. Now, luckily, prevailing southwesterly wind, for navigation purposes, there was a nice road to follow, pretty much. So... One of the options I had to think about was this circled bit on the slide here, where I could take the shortcut route, but there was a high risk here because the mountains dropped away suddenly, and I had to go over the back of those mountains. And if I was too low, I was at risk of the wing collapsing and crashing, which isn't good for health and survival. However, if I took the longer route... I was at risk of landing on some low foothills after I'd crossed the road to the north before I got into the high southerly-facing ridge to the north of them. 
Um, if I got onto that high southerly facing ridge, the bonus was it was facing the south, it was facing the sun, the thermals were likely to be stronger, so I was going to get higher. So preparation in paragliding, um, it's a sport that if you get it wrong, your life is potentially on the line. So preparation is absolutely key. Having the right equipment, knowing you've done everything you can to be prepared. So in terms of equipment, this is pre-lightweight mobile phones and handheld sat navs. This is the days when mobile phones were more like bricks. Um, so I had a map on my lap. I had a radio to talk to my ground crew. I had a compass. I had a camera to capture the, the trip. And also I had two very important instruments, a barograph which captures your height over time, um, which is required for a world record claim, and a variometer, which is an instrument which tells you how fast up and down the air around you is going. And you get an audio signal on this as well as visual. So when you're going up, you've got this very comforting beep, 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 and when you're going down, a rather disconcerting So, and as you probably appreciate paragliding relies on the senses and it takes years of kind of practice for the information you're getting through those senses for you to interpret that and make the right decisions. So you've got the temperature of the air around you, the direction that the winds may be hitting your face. You can hear the noise of the vario, you can hear the birds around you, maybe the sounds coming up from the ground below. You can see how the clouds are forming or deforming, where the wind is blowing smoke, which direction. You can also feel the weight of the handles that you're steering the paraglider by in your hand and your seat in the harness. And sometimes you can even taste the barbecues that are cooking below you. So this is a photo of the actual launch site where I flew from that day. Um, launch is a pretty stressful period. It's the ground that hurts. However, first thing I had to do was actually announce that I was going to make a world record attempt. Um, and I decided I was going for 101 kilometers to a declared goal. I had to get this witness that I'd made that announcement. Um, now, 101 kilometers to a declared goal means you have to actually arrive at where you said you were going to get to. You can't land short or you can't go off in a different direction. You have to get there. Okay? So this is like flying from London to Portsmouth with no engine. Just to put it into context for you. So. I was there. I was absolutely brimming with confidence. I remember it. And as I was on launch, so for launching a paraglider here, you've got the wing laid out behind you. I check, I pull it up, I check all the lines. Everything's okay, and I'm off. Straight into one of those spiral ladders up to cloud base. The Vario is giving me that very comforting beep, 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 beep. I know I'm on my way up that spiral ladder. Once you get there, you have a real bird's eye view of the world. It's, it's a fantastic view, and you have to be there to really appreciate it. However, this also gives you a bigger picture view of what's going on further down the route you want to take. And it's also a great time to talk with the ground crew on the radio and find out what information they've got from further down the course. And then putting all that together, I can make decisions on what are the best routes to go. Now, one of, the, one of the bits of information I had there was that cloud base wasn't particularly high over the mountains that I needed to kind of take the shortcut over. So I made the decision to take the longer way round. I got across the foothills, and I got onto the ridge and into the really strong, well-formed thermals. However, there's a general rule in flying. If the clouds are higher than they're wide, in paragliding, you need to steer clear of them because it means they're very, very active, and it can be quite dangerous getting sucked up into a cloud. Okay, but the one problem there is, when you're underneath them, you can't see how high they are. It's a bit of a problem. Okay, so there are occasions when you might risk getting sucked up into cloud. And I found myself underneath a monster of a cloud. The Vario was screaming at me. And I found myself going up at over 1,500 feet per minute. Now, if you think of Alton Towers roller coaster rides or a lift that's maybe or a lift that's out of control, they pale into insignificance. I then found myself in cloud. It's like being in a three-dimensional thick fog. You've no idea which way's up. You don't know which way's down. You start to disbelieve your compass and the question the theory of gravity. And you need to get out of here faster than you're going up. 
So somehow I need to be going down at more than 1,500 feet a minute, because otherwise I'm not going to get out of it. So what do you do? I trained for it. I trained to get out of these difficult situations. But what I had to do was put the paraglider into an intentional free fall, basically. <laughs> so that I was going down at about 2,000 feet a minute. That way, on average, I was losing about 500 feet a minute to get out of this cloud. OK? So sounds simple. You're holding it, and it's fighting you because it wants to fly. And it's quite a bumpy ride coming down. But the really scary bit comes at the end when you actually let go and you want it to come back to flying. And it accelerates forward and it throws you around all over the place. And for a few seconds, it is violent and chaotic and quite wild. Anyway, cool. got away with that. I'm still 5,000 feet above the ground. So height is safety. It's the ground that hurts. OK? And it's time to settle down to some nice, calm, relaxed flying. When? Oh, no. Oh, I've been in the air about four hours. Oh, my God, I need a pee. It's another of those peas. <laughs> now, what do you do thousands of feet above the ground in a swing seat wrapped up in lots of warm clothing? I knew from my previous experience that getting caught short meant I'd often land short of where I wanted to get when I was flying. So I'd experimented with various options. And that one that worked the best, hampers. <laughs> But you had to have the ones for the juniors, the bigger babies, the largest pampers you could find. So you might think that's quite a simple solution. However, it's not quite that simple, because years of potty training as toddlers are well ingrained in our brains. And while the, bra while the brain's kind of saying, it's OK, you're wearing your pampers, you can go, the body's going, oh, no, I can't. No, I can't. I'm not in the right place. The brain goes, yeah, it's OK, it's OK. And a little trickle comes out. And the body shuts it off. And it says, no, I can't possibly do that. I'm not in the right place. Eventually, as this battle between mind and body ensues, Pampers does what it says on the packet. And I can vouch for the fact they do keep you dry. <laughs> so with that pee out the way, it's time to get focused on a bit more flying and actually focusing on getting towards that world record. It's getting late in the day now. And as the sun gets lower, the thermals tend to get weaker. And I find myself low over a village in central Spain. And I'm kind of going up 20 feet, down 20 feet, up 20 feet, down 20 feet. Because what I'm in is a bubble of buoyant air, warm buoyant air that sits over the village. The villages heat up, and the warm air gets buoyant. And you can kind of just sit around there for a long time. You need patience, because that bubble needs to burst to become a thermal. And I have to sit there waiting patiently. And eventually, a car drives through the village. And that's enough to disturb the air and for it to pop the, th pop the bubble, if you like, and turn into a thermal. And I'm headed on my way back to cloud base again. As I've said before, one of the best places to be. Another couple of climbs, and I can see my goal. But I know you're not there, you're not there till you cross the finish line. I take an extra climb for safety. And I cruise into goal with a comfortable margin. And I can remember now landing on the airstrip of the gliding club there, absolutely shaking with emotion, thinking, my god, I've set a world record. I've broken somebody's record. And if I've got my calculations right, I've broken that elusive 100-kilometer barrier as well. Before long, my support team turned up, and the gliding club were very generous in helping us celebrate that evening um, before we had the, well, I had the hard graph then of collating the evidence. So part of that is this is the trace from the barograph, which is giving you height over time. Um, and as you can see, this kind of gives you an indication of the kind of uh, the spiral ladders going up to cloud base and the snakes coming down. But it doesn't actually give you the kind of distance traveled with each snake because it's over time. Um, gives you some, an idea of the incidences I've spoken about. And this is required as kind of proof that you've actually not got in a car, that you've actually flown it. <coughs> and I get my name on a world record certificate <coughs> from the International Air Sports Federation, which is like the FIFA of air sports. I'd spent 18 months thinking about this before I dared to blurt it out into public. But once I blurted it out into public, I really connected with that passion that I had to achieve it. 
I then spent several months doing absolutely everything I could in terms of preparation and planning. And you know, when, you ca when it came to it, the flying was the easy part. And I came away thinking, if I can do this, surely anyone can do that. And two days later, I broke another record. Such was my preparation and planning. So, imagine, if you were to focus on these three Ps, how high could you or you and your business fly? Because I want to challenge those original five Ps that we're so familiar with and say, actually, if you focus on your purpose, your passion and preparation, you will produce peak performance. So do this and you'll be on your own journeys to your own peak performances and records of success. Thank you.